Hey, uh, music gardeners. Welcome back or welcome me back. Um, I did this interview in uh, 2019 on my uh, 2019 Build the Bridges tour. Uh, I was so excited. I was interviewing um, Jarvis Tyner, the chairman of the New York Communist Party. I didn't know, I didn't put the pieces together, how it fit in with the Everybody Music idea. And um, till actually, uh, you know, recently I've just been thinking about this interview and I've been reading up on communism, like the roots of communism. I've just been thinking a lot about all these different isms. You know, I, I, I've been thinking about capitalism for a long time and anarchism. And uh, I really, at this point, I, I decided that it's best to think of them in terms of uh, ways of thinking, just uh, uh, like lenses of how we see the world, how we see possibility, the future, different, you know, how we can work together, and just like uh, how it colors our, our, our thinking, you know, these different isms. You know, and I, and I was just reflecting back, you know, in fact, I told Jarvis uh, that when we were forming Kamuziki back in 2013, somebody had said, Kamuziki, like we shouldn't spell it with two M's. I mean, it was bad enough that it sounded like Kamuziki. It sounds kind of like communism. And the two M's, like we should just have one M. But I mean, it was like community, you know. I mean, that was the idea of it. It was like uh, um, music is the key to community. So anyway... Uh, I was thinking more recently that uh, everybody music, the idea of everybody music, is is probably just as revolutionary as communism, and the idea that like you're taking the hierarchy out of music, and the idea that everybody is completely musical, and um, life is music. All these things, you know, they, they go against the grain, you know, like they go against what capitalism teaches us, for one thing. And, and, and one of the basic foundational concepts of uh, communism is, is the phrase, from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. And in me and everybody in music, I, I kind of like there's a, there's a feeling of that, you know, like, um, when I lead a music circle, I play close attention to each person's voice. I want to, like, I kind of check in, like, do they want to be heard or do they want to hide? You know, how connected are they to the group? Rhythmically, harmonically, emotionally, would they or the group benefit from giving them more attention? Like, if, if we gave them more attention, would that benefit them or the group? And... Uh, and also, maybe there's, are they sucking energy from the group? You know, these are like things that happen in society. And, um, and, and you know, you, when you think about like you want society, society to be healthy, you want to look at how are the individual people doing and what do they need to function best in the group and to grow. So I'm thinking about the health of the group in the same way I'm thinking about the health of each individual. So it's like they're, they're just intrinsically linked. But I, I see myself as the overseer of the vibe. So anyway, um, you know, and then, then, then I realized, I found out recently that uh, Jarvis Tyner's brother is McCoy Tyner and... Um, and so there's an interesting connection because they're both, you know, involved in these revolutionary movements that, that shift everybody's perceptions about life. Because as you know, and I know, life is music and music is life. So um, I'll shut up now and we'll listen to what 
Jarvis Tyner has to say. My name is Jarvis Tyner, T-Y-N-E-R, and I am the chair of the party, Communist Party of New York State. Also a member of the National Committee of the party. Okay. Cool. So the thing is that my organization, Build the Bridges, it's part of Kamizuki, we're always kind of trying to find these connections between what people are doing to build bridges. And so I had some questions here about the Communist Party and your role in basically building bridges. So like if we can kind of thinking about you know, I have a musical perspective, and if you have any mu- musical ideas, they can go in there, too. Mm-hmm. But generally, like, I, I want to ask you, um, what do you want people to know about the Communist Party? Well, I want to kind of uh, let them understand that uh, most of the things they've heard about the Communist Party are not true uh, and are designed to bring the party down and confuse people about what we really stand for. We stand for uh, making a transition, a democratic transition, a transition of the majority of people of our nation from capitalism to socialism. Because we believe that socialism is far more equipped and organized and uh, its basic vision uh, to bring economic and social justice to the people. It's an, ounce, it's an outlook that is rest, rest on working class, on the working class and the people who basically create the wealth. And our general view is that the people who create the wealth ought to control the wealth. And that's where we're heading. How, how do you get there is the big issue. And the reason why we just don't say that, but spend our day-to-day life working for democracy, for free elections, for better wages for working people, against racism, against misogynism, uh, to save the environment, all of those things, which people say, well, that's not so revolutionary. Well, it is, Mm -hmm. because capitalism rests on destroying those things. I mean, right now we have a president who is out to destroy what I would call the democratic consensus in the country that was established with the 30s New Deal, with the 60s civil rights peace, the the, the general notion that it's not democratic with a large D, but with a small D, that this should be a society that's fair, that's equal, that is uh, just to working people, and that the people count more than anything, people before profits, all those kind of things. Slogans now, which, you you know, all kinds of people pick up. But um, that's what's threatening us now. So you can't, if we can't beat this, there's no way we're going to make a transition to socialism. And beating this is the biggest thing. So we build bridges all the time. How, how do you build the bridges? How do you communicate with, that, let's say, like, even a Trump supporter, what, what would you say to a Trump supporter to get them on board? Basically, I would tell them to act in your own interest. Even a rich Trump supporter must recognize that global warming is real. And this guy is against it, and he is dismantling any effort to combat it. So that puts you and your family in jeopardy. Secondly, health care for all. Oh, I'm rich. I can have health care. I want to. Yeah. But... It's a guy five, that be five miles down the road is suffering from a ser- serious disease and can't get health care. You think that makes your life healthier? You'll build a fence around yourself? You're not going out? You're not going to breathe the air? I mean, come on. So health care for all is in your interest. The thing about workers' rights. All right, you want to lower the workers' wages if you're wealthy and moderately wealthy or own a small business. You think that's in your interest. But 70% of the consumers are working people. And if you impoverish them, we're heading for a recession every time. That's why we have cyclical crises all the time. So what we want you to understand, Mr. Supporter of Trump, that um, to uplift the working class, to build unity in the country, to respect women's rights, gay, lesbian people, to make sure that they have a decent life is in your national interest. If you're a patriot and you say you are, Join with me. Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, I I dig it. So, um, but you know, a lot of people across the board are afraid of socialism, let alone like communism. Like they feel like the word. uh, Someone actually told me that I couldn't name, I shouldn't name my organization Kamuzuki because it sounds too much like communism. 
What, what do you say to people like that? Because they're all across the country, I feel. Well, I've had over 60 years of, uh, well, 58 years. And you of, can talk, include your history, too, yeah. in this. Yeah, of uh, working for the work and being a member of the Communist Party in 1961, I, I joined. But also, uh, as a public communist, I probably had 55 years of doing it. So, including everything from my neighbors knowing, and how do you deal with that, to holding jobs in industry, how do you deal with that, and my union people knowing it, and so on. I think that the people have been bombarded with the false notion of the party, and also with pro-capitalist interpretation of what socialism was like which had its weaknesses, no question, made big mistakes in, in, in periods of history. But the r basic thrust, uh, as we see it, was that the working people take power was to provide a better life for working people. Marx says uh, to make happiness the lot of the working people. That was supposed to be the concept. But then the entire imperialist world surrounded Russia, surrounded all, and did everything they could to make this fail. They controlled the international economy. Right now, they're doing the same thing with Cuba and Venezuela. They're destroying, trying to destroy it. And they say, see, it doesn't work. The, the truth is, see, we stopped it from working. That's what's really going on. Yeah. Uh, but, but don't go by those models. They're not our model. We don't. You, every country has its own model. There is no really basic model of what uh, socialism, other than some general principles of, uh, of uh, social ownership of the means of production and transportation, uh, uh, where the working people have full uh, control and, uh, I would say, um, uh, power in the political process, the economic process, and so on, where education is free, health care is free, because the great wealth of society will be put in a social fund which will provide all these things. We have a country with a material basis for it. Most of those other countries never had it. China is now trying to develop it. Mm. And that's why they're scared of China, because China's going to pass us in terms of um, productivity. And that's the basis for it passing us in terms of standard of living. And I think they're scared of that. Yeah. So uh, capitalism really passed its usefulness. It is not completely not useful because the technology that has emerged out of capitalism is quite valuable for humanity. The problem is the average working people, person doesn't get the advantage of it. And they use it for one purpose, to make money, not to make life better for people. We make life better for people in a general sense by making a cleaner car and all that. But if they had to be forced to make clean cars, and they, and they still aren't clean, you know what I'm saying? But now they're moving electric because they recognize people gotten hip to this thing is killing us, you know. So all of those things um, come into play. And um, we have to build it. The party has always had the concept of building united fronts. Unity of action, but diversity in ideas. That's the concept. And through mm. that, and through that, that's what operated, up, made up how we operated uh, during the, the Second World War to fight against fascism and the building of the United Front against it, knowing, recognizing the different uh, digressions of uh, ideological understanding and, and uh, direction and policies. But we all are affected by the destruction of democracy worldwide and the murder and the slaughter and the racism and the hatred, the anti-Semitism, all these things that was destroying our, our... And so there was a great United Front. And Were well, you talking about at what period of time? during the fight against fascism. That's what I'm talking about, the Second World War. And we pursued that policy domestically. It helped to build mass organizations of the people, uh, both in the 30s and in the 40s and 50s. But after the 50s and the defeat of fascism, the world imperialism got afraid that they were going to lose their dominant grip on the world. You had this whole new thing of a system of socialist states. They panicked, and, and we had McCarthyism. Oh, yeah, okay, so that was sort of like a backlash. Back yeah, which so, is kind of what we're going through now. If you right, right. Through so would, would you, like, could you envision, what did the Communist Party do back in those days to, you, you feel like it defeated fascism, at least it suppressed it, and now it's sort of like a cancer that, that can reemerge. 
Yeah, the germ was still there, man. Right? Yeah. Because the germ is inherent in the capitalist system, if you ask me. That's, I, right, I'm, uh, I'm with you on that. It's in the bowels of capitalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's deep down in there. <laughs> so um, what do you think the Communist Party, what role did the Communist Party play back in that day? Well, you know that in the early 30s when fascism was rising, it was the communist in the United States and around the world who went to Spain to defend Republic Spain against uh, Italy and the uh, who was aligned with uh, the king and the uh, so the, the Republicans in Spain won the election they're not like the Republicans we have today but they won the election and, and moving in a democratic progressive direction and the uh, monarchy and the right wing fa- Spanish fascists with, aligned with Italian fascism, moved to destroy uh, this great achievement. So the United States, rather than support this, basically said it was neutral. Uh, but the socialist countries, Soviet Union, and, and other socialist movements around the world said we will, we will come to their defense. So you had the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, that from the United States. Uh, several thousand, I think it was, Americans, mainly workers, young workers, who went to fight in Spain. They, we lost that battle, and many of them uh, perished. Although there's a few still alive, and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade still exists. Uh, thank goodness for that, and does good work. Um, like now, they're helping on Venezuela, helping on Cuba, and stuff like that. They're still with a, with the fight, but. So we were premature, they, as they say, premature uh, anti-capitalists. And then when the Soviet Union uh, was invaded and, and the, the fascists uh, were making their great advance through Europe and creating uh, genocide and murder all, all the way through, um, the whole world, the whole world communist movement was united to defeat uh, fascism. And uh, the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, uh, it was used as a diversion. While Germany had built up a powerful military machine, the Russians didn't have it. They needed time to build it. And the proof of the pudding is once they got time to build it, they kicked some fascist ass. You know what I'm saying? Like history has never seen. In fact, they did it so well that the United States was just hedging whether we should get in a war because U.S. capital hoped that the fascists would first destroy socialism, then we'll make a deal with them, and we'll have a nice world with, you know, sort of bourgeois capitalists and fascist capitalists working together. Yeah. This is an illusion. Then they bombed Pearl Harbor and said, hey, guys, we want you too. We're running this thing. And, and then they, they had to enter the war. But Roosevelt said that the turning point of the battle against fascism was Stalingrad, hmm. which was held held the fascists off for I don't know how many weeks, months, and uh, ultimately defeated them. And, they, and, and and the Germans put everything in there they could to defeat them, and they failed. Then everybody said, Ah, we can win this battle. So wow. the communists were all part of that of that whole process. And then American communists, even though some of them were uh, put in obscure places and weren't allowed. To, to participate, a whole bunch of them were in the, in the U.S. military fighting against fascism that way. And then down here, you know, you ever see that scene of that big fascist rally at uh, Madison Square Garden uh, when Hitler was rising? <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't. I need to look, see look, that. Look, Google it. Yeah. It was, you know, the place was packed. Really? Yeah. Madison Square Garden. In the 30s. In the, late, in the early, in the mid-30s, I guess and it was. who was there. speaking there? Oh, what, whoever, Father Gochlin and all them, them crazed fascists were speaking. Huh. And they wanted to bring it here. You know, we have a whole German community on the east side of Manhattan, for Yorkville, that had a huge uh, organized base among American Germans in support of fascism. So, uh, you know, from your perspective, because uh, to me it's what's happening now is very scary. So you have this perspective, a historical perspective that um, would affect how you feel about today. So how does that play into it? Like, how does this compare to what it was like back in those days? Well, very much so, because if you if you think about what Trump is really doing, he's destroying that democratic consensus. He's anti-labor. 
We won the 30s, the right to labor to organize. He's doing everything to destroy the NLRB. is now taken over and run by his people, and they're destroying the Labor Department and the federal government. This is uh, Mitch, Mitch McConnell's wife, Cho, 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 I think her name is, is running it. And they're destroying uh, it, uh, the uh, power of labor to organize and to exist. He's trying to take that apart. You know what he did about uh, the environment and pulling out of the Paris Accords, but not only that, now they've made all kinds of rules and opened up the, the, uh, the national parks and stuff for exploration and and, and our waterways. Oh, it's just it's just a, a terrible, terrible attempt to reverse history, civil rights. Uh, I don't know where to start. Yeah, yeah. Except yeah. to say they don't enforce the laws that were fought for and won. So American capitalism didn't embrace democracy. It had to be fought for, including the Civil War. We, they lived with slavery. The founding fathers were, were, were slave owners, some of them big slave owners. Yeah. And they didn't want to touch slavery. They wanted to get rid of British so that the American capitalism could grow. Mm. And there's a lot of feeling that the American Revolution was not completed until after they overthrow slavery. I, Some of you described the Civil War as the Second American Revolution. I, I think that's part, part two. Part two. Yeah. And uh. they didn't embrace it. They didn't embrace it. Including Lincoln hedged on the issue of right. race and all that. Yeah. It had to be imposed on them by the power of the people. Right, exactly. And, 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 and so, so now capitalism reached a point, a critical point, because there's actually a crisis on continuing the same old BS and racism and division and hatred and just all the money should go up top and they'll take care of us. Nobody believes that anymore. They don't believe it. And we don't believe it. So we went with trickle down and who wants to be trickled down on? You know, that's what someone is looking yeah. We went from trickle down to, uh, well, as somebody said, well, the reason we had a depression was because we didn't have rich people. Really? <laughs> the only stupid things. Yeah. That are doom to bring us to doom and 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 ex- create an existential crisis for our nation. It's capitalism. Yeah, it's capitalism. So so where 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 is the hope? Where where do you see the hope for all this? Because this crisis. Well, to be simple, uh, we had a great example of that in the midterm elections. Here's an interesting thing: two thousand Trump uh, Bush. Stole the election. He actually yeah. lost the popular vote and stole it in Florida. Right. See, they were already a minority, a party. They were not strong, as strong as the Democrats as an electoral party or as a legislative party. But they gerrymandered. They had a huge, well-financed effort to take power. Even right. though they were a minority party, so with the Supreme, they had a lot of power in the Supreme Court, and they had the Supreme Court, which they now have a majority. Yeah. So we saw that they didn't have the power. And, and, 20, and then the, the, the country, you know, the Clinton was wishy-washy. But next to them, he looked like the savior to a lot of people. And to elect them was right. That people had no choice to get away from that. Yeah. But then after that, the Bushes came back in and, and started their mess. And even though they disguised their true reactionary basis, and in fact, on some social questions, they were not as anywhere near as reactionary as this guy. Trump, who now attacks them bitter, viciously, and everything, but he did not win a majority of the vote. Trump, when he came into twenty six, it was a manipulation of the electoral process. If seventy thousand votes would have been shifted in Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, and Michigan had been shifted the other way, he would not be president. But he's acting like. The whole nation rose up and elected him. He's the greatest guy in the world. I do everything right. Everything I do is wonderful. It's the first time this has ever happened. Total lies. Based on a total lie. A, a, a multiple a multiple mountain of lies that he just keeps living, that he keeps falsifying. So basically there is a majority out. That's what I'm trying to say. And despite all the obstacles. 2018, it came out, and they got walloped in the Congress, and um, it, they and they did it on health care issues, and they did it on unity issues, 
And then you had the women coming out b- yeah. by the millions, marching against them. That's the people. You had the youth after the shootings and all of the stuff. They, they lit a fire in this country, and the right wing nuts took power, took 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 a, it as a green light to do anything they want to do. And that's why we're seeing all this killing and shooting. And they did that. They opened the door to that, and these young people organized, and they had a, a million people marching. We never had, we never had that. Yeah, I would say the one, the one, one uh, element that was didn't quite get on the bandwagon was labor, because one third of organized workers who voted actually voted for Trump. So they have some division in their ranks, but they, yeah. they, they're getting it over because now guys said the tax cut didn't. What did that do for me? See what happened to truckers? 29,000 truckers have been laid off because the tax cut has slowed the economy down so much. And this guy, um, uh, Trump, I think he could just BS his way through everything. And you can for well, a while. Evidently, so far, he's yeah, been able you can, to. You can can for a while. Yeah. But after a while, you know what they say? The fit's going to hit the sand. <laughs> yeah. Now, here, here's a, a fear that I have, and it's like actually coming up now through this, I'm thinking, because, like, if if... Trump doesn't win. We could people could come complacent because that's kind of what it was before. That's one of the silver linings of this whole thing. Is I see so much activity. Do you do you what, what do you see? Like how can we make sure that we keep this thing going regardless of who's who's uh, up there on the top? Well, some people I think will get demoralized and pull back a bit, but I think that the thrust of history is that the movement goes forward, makes gains, it gets pushed back, it pushes. Dr. King says the arc of humanity, you know, bends towards social justice. The arc of humanity is still going to be out there. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. And it, 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 it is already, it's already put him in a weaker position, and I believe we're going to defeat him. I believe we're going to defeat him. He's going to do everything to stop. But let's say we don't. Well, let's say we do, then, yeah. and so that we have to... What are the other challenges? Because he's like an obvious challenge, mm-hmm. you know, and everybody... But 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 without him, I think in, in, in a way it's kind of more complicated. We have to like look it at... It is, it is, because I think... I think it, uh, but I think capitalism's ability to solve basic human problems, decent education for all, civil rights... Gay rights, women, the environment, housing crisis. You take New York City, beautiful, beautiful edifices. The capitalism growing up all over, but the working class can. And they're getting thrown out of their houses. They're getting moved out of the city. And in the suburbs, it's full of poor people now. All of these things, these are fundamental crises, and they're existential in a lot of ways because they impact on the economy. Now, for example, you, you cross a bridge and it, the technology, you don't need a person to collect the tolls anymore. I don't know how many people lost their jobs with that. Not to mention what's happened with manufacturing and export of capital. What are you going to do with these folks? What are you going to do with people? They have to live and they got to they gotta fight. Yeah, They got to fight. And that's our job to find the best way to get them to. Right, so like kind of providing yeah. a support system for like people to... Puerto Rico... Yeah, they've been banged around. This guy goes out and throws paper towels at people, and people are dying. They lied about that, but it reached a qualitative point where there was a huge leap, and the masses just poured out, and and this guy is gone. The governor, they got a long fight ahead of them, but this yeah. guy is gone, and the people did it. I don't yeah. think they're gonna go home and say, well. Jose, everything is fine. Yeah, right. Maria, we have no more problems, so they know. Yeah, yeah, they know. right. Like because we are, and it's hard to it's hard to not notice it. <laughs> so, um, and the more of us, like, see, part of part of what I uh, the mission of my organization is to wake up people that are uh, asleep and the ones that can afford to be asleep, yeah. the people with the privilege to right. kind of sleep through it all. And um, and I don't, I don't feel like they're really there's a part of them that actually knows that they have to wake up. Right. So I, I, I and that's what music is for. But um, I I think that some of those people are still like there's some confusion about socialism and communism. It's sort of like I think some people see communism as a kind of just like a, a stronger 
a bigger version of social socialism is kind of like communism light or something. Can you can you shed some light on like what some of those differences are? Well, communism is a high stage of socialism. That was was in the Communist Manifesto, um, meaning. On at, at this present stage, socialism is from each according to their ability and, and their work and so on, and to each, no from each according to their ability to each according to their work. But communism reaches a point of of absolute abundance that it's actually to each according to their need. And people and you know people every time you see a movie about something like in the future, it's always that the people have to be coerced to accept. Uh, a, a government that helps them, or it's it's all confused the way they do it. But the point yeah. is, if a government would have made sure that my mother, when she got Alzheimer's, would have gotten gotten good care, she had no health care. If they'd have made sure, I ain't gonna complain about that. I'm not gonna complain if my brother would have gotten his, uh, a scholarship to go to music school. He he did actually, but all the way through the graduate school and so on. I'm not going to complain about that. The government has only really fundamentally one purpose, to help the people. I don't think it has a, the wealthy people don't need the help, but they're the ones, they're the ones who get the benefit from the society. So I think um, in that sense, the, the socialists bargain with the people is that people will come before profits and wealth and uh, abundance is possible to eliminate poverty to eliminate bad housing, health care, to guarantee health care for all, and so on. And there, after that, which is way in the future, but after that, at some point, Marxist concept was that it would evolve into a full communist society. So the Communist Party itself calls itself communist because it is supportive of this com new communist society. But in our lifetime, I think the fight we will face most uh, vigorously and most um, uh, in an overwhelming sense is the fight to realize a socialist change. Oh, okay, so so like you can work with like the Bernie Sanders and all. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, and so oh, so sorry, that yeah. this vision of the future of the, of the of the far future where there is like you know f it's basically you know full equality and uh, where the balance is because. Uh, I mean that's that encapsulates a whole lot, just like uh, equality. So, could you describe that vision? So that that's kind of like uh, the light that we're aiming for, right? Yeah. And how, how do you? What, what does that look like? Well, <laughs> I just read a piece about that. A uh, guy, a Canadian labor guy, wrote a wrote a piece of what, how socialism will work, and he was mainly talking about how it would be administered. And he ain't talking about communism. I don't even know if he's for that, but socialism. Um, the the communist concept. Keep in mind that this land, for most of its existence, people lived in a communal state. Mm. That is, there was no private property. People shared what they had. Uh, the native people here lived. I guess thousands of years living cooperatively and sharing, and in a, in a, in a, in a what you call primitive communist state. The land, that's why this love of the land, they always oh, show so they love the land, the mountains, yeah. the water, we love it. Right. Because they live close to it. That was yeah. their legacy, that was their culture, that was their religious, that was their belief. Um, and it was with the introduction of capitalism that you had slavery. That the Indians who controlled the land that was on their land had to be removed to allow for the development of uh, the growth of capitalism. Yeah, and um, ultimately, um, they imported Africans to do the hard labor to so to to uh, cultivate the land and produce this wonderful product called cotton. <laughs> King cotton was. King all over the world, and the richest people in this country then were the owners of the land and the production and textile and so forth associated with cotton. But after a while, uh, it reached a crisis. 
First of all, we were treating human beings like animals. It was a moral crisis. Second of all, it was even the economic crisis because these guys were so powerful, they were slowing down the growth of industrial, finance, and commercial capitalism. Civil War. And Lincoln was on the right side, but, you know, he hedged, and so on. Um, and the ideology of racism was there was to enforce the dominance of the uh, capitalist class and the racism and, and, and slavery and so on. So, um, ultimately, in the 1920s and 30s, when, when, when this Russian revolution took place and the growth of, of socialist and communist movements developed, there was a tremendous pressure on the United States after the Depression, you know, with, during the Depression, which created this huge left progressive movement, which ultimately created the social safety net that we're still fighting to hold on to. Social security, uh, relief, welfare for people who were thrown out. In the old days, you got thrown out, you went to the church. The church says, uh, here, you can have this bread, but you got to come to the church. And, and then, then the church is fine. said, we can't do this. It's too big for us. The whole movement then, with the organization of labor and so forth, shifted the paradigm, and we ended up with the New Deal. And now... Capitalism is ready to destroy that. And that's what we're, we're, we're experiencing now. But the main thing, I'm, the main point I'm trying to make is that history is on our side on all this stuff. And we will ultimately reach a point where people will understand. They actually kind of do now. If you take away the, the names that they've been told are bad names, if, if you talk about what would it actually do, like now... Healthcare for all is a commonly supported idea. Well, in the back in the old days, I ran for vice president of the United States. Not in the old days, even seventy two and seventy six, and we raised healthcare for all, free healthcare. Yeah. You say when a baby is born, they get a card, and the card says you're with the National Health Service, and they hold that for the rest of their life. They never have to pay a medical bill the rest of their life. They said we should be able to do that. They do it in England. They can do it here. They can do it there. Why can't this powerful country do it? The reporters went bananas. What? You're talking about who's going to pay for that? Why should we do that? Everybody should work hard to get, you know, this kind of... Um, Did they go more bananas then than they do now? Yeah. Yeah. So it was more radical then than... than yeah, it is. Yeah. So we made... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but you, And you also had a shift in public opinion. And... Uh, even though, even some of these backward politicians now agree that some form of concessions have to be made around health care, even though the Republicans and their minority are blocking this thing wherever they can. Yeah. They will fall. I tell you, we're going to have health care in this country. We got to, you know. Yeah. So um, these, are, these are socialist kind of programs. Social Security is essentially that. Yeah. When you call the fire department, you don't have to take out yeah. your credit card, do you? <laughs> yeah. Public education, environmental protection, public Ro park, roads, roads. roads. Yeah, yeah. See, you, you can't run that stuff on the basis of, well, I've got to make a profit out of this. Yeah, right. So you get up from work every day, and you got to ride a private road, you know, and so on. It's Some places it's like that, but what I'm trying to say, it's not workable. Yeah. And so that evolution of thought and need, and based on human need, um, brings people to a greater understanding. And our job is to help that process as we participate in the day-to-day -day fight people are going through. Yeah. Cool. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I could go on and on. Like, what, what's our time like here? My time is a little tight right now. So yeah. Sorry. So should we wrap it up? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I had to do some things before our meeting at one. Okay, because let, let me just ask you one more thing. Okay. Yeah. So, what what keeps you going? Like, what 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 do you feel like is is exciting about the Communist Party and your involvement with it right now? Like, if you could just. Well, I've seen the party evolve over over fifty years, from and recover from the McCarthy period. And even though there was a lot of a red baiting around the civil rights and peace move and so forth, it found a way to get involved in it. And I learned so much about tactics, how to do it. You know, you learn something about if you can't sort of organizationally approach people, we have a newspaper which speaks to people's needs. And through that, 
people can gain a better, higher insight by reading our newspaper. And uh, we were told at the convention that our online newspaper now has peaked to uh, a, a million readers over the year. A million readers. Of, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Daily Worker didn't do that. Huh. Uh, we also need, a, I think, a, a print paper to hand out. Like this weekend we're going up to the Harlem uh, Festival up there, and there are going to be about 50,000 people walking by. And a paper would be nice to have. We don't have a print paper we have with them, but we'll, we'll we'll figure that out. So, um, to me, I think uh, this this shift is very important. Ocasio Cortez says she's a democratic socialist. Bernie says democratic socialist. Bernie got 16 million votes. Democratic socialist. That never. Yeah. Something's going on. Yeah. 60 percent of people call themselves liberal Democrats. So. I'm, more pro-socialist than pro-capitalist. Uh, uh, among young people, 30 and under, the majority are more favorable to, capital, to socialism than capitalism. It's the old heads like, like me, you know, who think that capitalism yeah. is uh, the greatest thing ever happened. And my God, we can't lose it. My, what are we going to do? But the Social Security that keeps us alive, socialist measure. Yeah. So I think we have to, you know, just keep that battle going. I feel hopeful about that. I think yeah. People, I think the people. I have a lot of faith in people. I was talking to, to Angela Davis. She's spoken here several times in the last two or three years, and when she was under indict under indictment and was on the run because she thought they were going to really crucify her if they caught her and yeah. blame her. And they wanted her. to. So and they wanted to. And they made it clear. Yeah. The President of the United States said that she was a terrorist and we're going to catch her and pro pers prosecute her to the fullest extent of the law. That's death penalty. And the great movement around her was developing. Yeah. And she had the good sense to contact people and said, I think I need to come in because we got to fight this thing. This is no good. She was going to go to Cuba, I'm telling you. Yeah. Since this is no good, I gotta, I gotta get out there. Yeah. They knew she was doing this. They had found her and tapped her or whatever. They knew how to get in touch where she was. She was on her way in to to go with her attorney and turn herself in. And she was at the Howard Johnson's on Eighth Avenue, and they went and got her. They knew she was there because they, what they wanted her to do was to do something crazy like rob a bank or something. Yeah. And then they would murder her. Hey, we cut this commie and so forth. But the thing that she concluded was, that just like we concluded during the McCarthy period, if we stay and fight, the American people can be one to support us and we will survive in that way. We don't even necessarily have to get a majority of it, but we can get a base and they will support us. And we're going to fight for that. And the confidence in the American people, I think, is a winning strategy. And a lot of the left doesn't have that. They really see only what they think they can do, which is very frustrating because most groups are small, relatively. Anyway, so I think confidence in American people and working people, that they can be one if you fight for their interests and you get involved and become a part of their life fabric, their life, they'll support you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, um, I was at the Black Lives Matter rally up there. Was, was there a party... Representation up there here in New York, recently? yeah, but Harlem. We went from Harlem down to 59th Street. There were some people marching there, yeah. There was no banner and all that, but I think there, there were some yeah. people from the Uptown Club. And because, because uh, I think you know, like I, I, I'm looking for ways to for people to kind of face their fears around what they see, right. uh, and so like Angela Davis was has always been a registered communist, right? Is that right? She's not a member now. She's not a member. Ninety one, she left. Okay, but she's a friend, a friend and supporter. She says my ideas have not changed. We had a little internal struggle back in ninety one, and the Soviet Union collapsed. And she was on the other side, so she withdrew. But she knows. I mean, she she's spoken here. She's supporting uh, our, basically our political line and policies pretty much, and uh, she's a friend. You know? Yeah. Uh, and a comrade, really. It's a good spirit, a comrade. Right. So, yeah. Well, fantastic. I really appreciate you giving this time and, like, enlightenment. Um, I think I, I really look forward to people uh, hearing this. And, yeah, and, and, good. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for doing it. I appreciate it. All right. It.
You take care. You too.